The previous video showed that if you separate Smith & Jones into two separate rooms, you only tell them the price ratio between apples and bananas, you can't get an equilibrium. You get excess demand in one commodity and excess supply in the other commodity. But the conclusion to draw is not that we should just give up using the price system to allocate commodities between these two. The conclusion is not that they have to get together and talk. Instead, the conclusion is you can't arbitrarily come up with some price ratio, like one apple to two bananas, and have it work. We're going to have to come up with this price ratio in some kind of intelligent, thoughtful way instead of just on a completely arbitrary basis. To analyze how to do that, turn your attention to the right-hand Edgeworth box where I've drawn Smith and & Jones and the contract curve. And you'll recall what the contract curve means. It's The contract curve joins all the points where you have an indifference curve of Smith that's tangent to an indifference curve for Jones. So if I draw some indifference curves for Smith, then you got an indifference curve for Jones that's tangent to each of these indifference curves for Smith and it's tangent on the contract curve. Now, whenever you have two curves that are tangent to each other, they define a tangent line. Let's draw some of the tangent lines in. Okay, so those are some of the tangent lines. There are an infinite number of pairs of indifference curves, one for Smith and one for Jones, <coughs> which generates each of the infinite number of points on the contract curve. And every one of those pairs generates a tangent line. And so what you can see is that the entire Edgeworth box is actually f full of tangent lines. And therefore, any arbitrary point let's say A, is going to be intersected by at least one tangent line. It might be intersected by more than one tangent line because as you can see the tangent lines aren't necessarily parallel to each other. But we know there's going to be at least one tangent line that does go through point A because the whole box is filled with tangent lines. So now let's turn to the larger diagram there's going to be one tangent line that goes through point A. I don't know where it is, but I can draw one in just supposing that I, I didn't know where it was. And that tangent line was generated by a pair of isoquants, I mean a pair of indifference curves, one for Smith and one for Jones, like this. So I've drawn in the isoquant for Smith, which is which is this one, and the isoquant for Jones, which is this one. And they must be on the their the point where they're tangent is part of the contract curve. So the contract curve is coming in like that. And that generates this blue tangent line, which goes through point A. What I'm going to do is Instead of what I did before, just tell them tell both people one apple for two bananas. Instead, I'm going to give them the the ratio that's consistent with this blue line. In other words, measure the the rise and run of this blue line. And whatever that is, you that should be the price ratio. So whatever, I, I don't know what the ratio is, but whatever this ratio is, the, um, the, this is the apples and this is the bananas, 
So you can measure them and divide and get the ratio of apples to bananas along the blue line. And you tell them that that, pro that, that number is the price ratio. Okay, so then what Smith is going to do is the following. He starts out at point A, and now his budget constraint is the blue line. So given that the blue line is his budget constraint, and given that one of his indifference curves is this one labeled S, Smith is going to go to this point, call it, call it E. Now let's think about Jones. His initial point is A, so his budget constraint is also going to be the blue line. He's going to go to where that budget constraint has a tangent with his indifference curve. And as you can see, that means Jones is also going to go to point E. So both Smith and Jones want to go to point E. This is going to work because E is just a point on the Edgeworth box. So you'll have, in terms of apples, Smith is going to want this many apples. Jones is going to want this many apples. That works. In terms of bananas, Smith is going to want this many bananas, and Jones is going to want this many bananas, so that works also. So everything works out. In other words, if you choose the price ratio correctly, if you choose it based on this blue line, which is generated by Jones's indifference curve and Smith's indifference curve, so it's generated by their preferences, it's sensitive to their preferences, then there is a way of getting them both to move from point A to point E. Now point E has two characteristics. Not only is it an equilibrium, in other words, you don't have any excess demands for apples or bananas, you don't have any excess supply of apples and bananas. I just showed that it's an equilibrium. But it's also on the contract curve, which means it's Pareto efficient. It's Pareto optimal. So what we've succeeded in doing is not only moving from A to another equi equilibrium point, to an equilibrium point, which is E, but we've also succeeded in moving to an optimum point, an efficient point. In other words, this is showing how you can use the price mechanism, the price system, a competitive market, competitive pricing, as a coordinating mechanism to move an economy to a Pareto efficient equilibrium point even if nobody talks to one another. You don't need any communication here between the agents. All you need to know is that the agents know one number which is the price. Now if you have an economy with many different commodities they have to know all the prices but that's all they have to know. And then simply maximizing their own selfish utility without giving a thought to anybody else they're going to be led, Adam Smith said, as if by an invisible hand, to go to a point like E, which is, number one, an equilibrium point, and number two, an efficient point. So this is the so-called first theorem of welfare economics. Let me type that. So I typed it on the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. The first theorem of welfare economics says a competitive equilibrium is pretty optimal. We're not going to talk about the second theorem of welfare economics. And it's a modern version of Adam Smith's invisible hand, that the free competitive market leads to a situation that's good in two senses. It's an equilibrium situation, and it's an efficient situation. That is, it's, a, that is, it's Pareto optimal. Now, we saw before that it doesn't have to be fair if the initial allocation point A were instead to be, let's say, way over here. We'll call it A prime, then you're starting out in an economy where, for some reason, Smith ends up having almost all of the bananas and almost all of the apples, and Jones has very little. You can still get from that point to a point on the contract curve, but it's, it's going to be a, a point that reflects voluntary choice by Smith, and so it's going to be a situation where Smith still has the vast majority of the resources in the economy. There are many other assumptions that we've made over the course of this semester in order to simplify the situation to get to this.
one of the most obvious ones from my point of view, since one of the things that I teach is environmental economics, is that there are no so-called externalities, that, that what Smith does only affects Smith, and what Jones does only affects Jones. Uh, it's not the case that one of them, let's say, creates pollution that adversely affects the other. So there are lots of simplifying assumptions that go into this, and immediately concluding that the first theorem of welfare economics is applicable to the real world and therefore that you don't need let's say government to help out is quite premature. It's another way to see this. In the real world there is nobody who does this calculation. Here's apples and here's bananas. In other words here's where the blue line is. Let's figure out where apples and bananas um, are on that blue line. In other words this is the slope and then tell everybody what the price is. There's no agent that does that. In other words, the first theorem says if the economy is at the equilibrium price, then everything works out. But there's actually no mechanism here to describe how the economy could ever get to the equilibrium price. The only people in this model really are Smith and Jones. And the there is no imaginary in-between person who can do the calculation and tell Smith and Jones exactly what the right price is. And so this is a problem that we first saw when we talked about simple, simple demand and supply. We said that's a competitive equilibrium price and quantity, but that there's no mechanism to get to that price and quantity if you happen to be above it or if you happen to be below the price. Similarly, if you're not at the right price in this large diagram in the Edgeworth box, there's no mechanism that gets you to the right price. So if you happen to be at the right price, everything is fine. There's no mechanism that, that, uh, that in, in this model to get you there. The first neoclassical economist who thought hard about this was Leon Walras. In the late 19th century, he was a Swiss economist. And Walras came up with the idea of a, what we now call the Walrasian auctioneer. As being some imaginary agent who can calculate this this these this correct price ratio and then tell it to the two agents but Walras was quite clear that there is no such thing as a Walrasian auctioneer in the real world he just used it as a, a theoretical construct to help think through the problem but because there aren't any Walrasian auctioneers in the real world in a competitive market then it doesn't help answer the question now if we don't have competition if we have something else some other kind of market structure then they may be talking to each other um, and th there, there are lots of other ways of coming to agreement to exchange information but here we're just thinking about competitive equilibrium and in competitive equilibrium there is no way of getting to the competitive equilibrium price so the first theorem of welfare economics is a nice result and it in some sense justifies Smith's version, Adam Smith's version of the invisible hand but it leaves open very large questions about how one would ever achieve, achieve competitive equilibrium, in other words how one would ever get into competitive equilibrium.